He's got good Twitter game. We're going to check in now on the recruiting trail and the halfway point of the UCF season with Juan Toribio who covers UCF for nights 24 7. Juan, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, I was, guys. It was a pleasure. As we record on a Sunday night, before we get your take, uh, quick take on the Navy game and as well, UCF 6 0 start, talk about a little news UCF is making with a pretty big uh, commitment. Yeah, we're following up the you know, 6 0 start from yesterday, you know, UCF landed a three star commit. Four star, depending on on the website you look at, Eric Gilliard, He's a linebacker from Trinity Christian out of Jacksonville. It's a great school for you to break into and get some kids out of there. And you know, Jordan Johnson, Otis Anderson are some of the guys from Jacksonville that have have came to UCF and have have already produced in their first two years here. So it's a big, big guy for for the staff. They need some more linebackers with Shaquan Burkett graduating this year. So yeah, big start to the, to. I guess a great ending to the weekend, I should say. Yeah, let's uh, before we get back to recruiting, what's your your quick take on the Navy game? And then, if you could, you cover the team a day in and day out from six, seven weeks ago to now. What's what's your big takeaway at this halfway point of the season? Yeah, well, I mean, I kind of touched on it a little bit on Twitter, but I think I thought this was probably the most impressive win, and not you know not on the not in the sense of what happened on the field. It was probably their sloppiest game. They probably should have put a, put up 50 again this week. They only put up 31, obviously. But it was the most impressive just because they handled some adversity. I mean, obviously, the, the first five games, they kind of just blew everyone out. This game, you know, it was tied twice. And both times, UCF just kind of marched on the field. Obviously, the Adrian Kittens 79-yard run was in one play. So they kind of responded. And that's something I, I wanted to see. I wanted to see what happened when, you know, the game's tied in the third, fourth quarter, you know. Who steps up? Who looks good? Who kind of you know? How does the sideline look? It's easy to dance around and wave your towels and just you know be in a good mood when you're up by forty. But it's it's a little bit different when you're only up by a touchdown or you're tied. And I thought the team handled it great. I thought Frost handled it very well. So yeah, it was it was it was the most interesting game I've, I've watched all season. I mean that we've all watched because of all the blowouts. So it, it it was it wasn't the prettiest game on, on the field, but it was the most meaningful game just to see how the team reacted to certain things. How good can this team be this season? Very good. I mean, I, someone asked me today on Twitter, you know, who can who can stop this team? And just my answer was just themselves. I mean, obviously they've had a couple of penalties, and that's, that's kind of slowed them down a little bit. They had seven yesterday. So, yeah, it's really just themselves at this point. And, and they, after getting through the Navy game, if you look at the schedule, and obviously you don't want to get too ahead of yourself, but – you know, you got Austin P, SMU, UConn, Temple, and then you you obviously get USF at the end, which is you know more than capable of winning that game. But they don't look very good right now. So yeah, at this point, it's just themselves. If if they keep if they keep improving and they just kind of keep putting in the work, and they've gotten better every week in in, in little in little every every sense of the way with the special teams that didn't look that good early on, defense, offense. So. Yeah, right now it's just themselves. If if they don't hurt themselves, if they stay healthy, um, or if another hurricane doesn't doesn't stop by, that's that seems to be the only time they don't put a fifty. So yeah, it's just right now they're they're clicking on all cylinders and it's 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 fun. One of the things that you do on Twitter that I like is every once in a while you'll just impromptu say, "Hey, what questions do you have?" And one of the ones that I saw asked of you today was, "With everything going so well, does that help?" recruiting or might it hinder recruiting since there are so many freshmen playing maybe a kid sees well where what how am i going to fit into the mix i liked your answer there could you share your thought on that yeah uh, i mean the, the the short answer is it definitely helps and the reason behind that is you know obviously there, there is a lot of young players you know stepping up for the team but that entices recruits to kind of go to that place because it shows them that you can play if you're ready to play. You know, not every freshman is going to play. I feel like we're a little bit spoiled when it comes to, you know, a, a true freshman kind of coming in and you're kind of expecting him to be ready. Some kids, it takes six, six seven games. You know, we're kind of seeing that with Marlon Williams. He's one of those guys that came in with a little bit of hype, didn't necessarily play too much at the beginning. And now he's starting to, you know, he's probably the best blocking receiver on the team. So, I, yeah, it definitely entices a recruit to, if, he, if you think this is the best place for you to come, and if you, you're willing to put in the work, that you can play early. There's there's a lot of young players, but Frost and his staff have showed that they don't really care if you're a freshman, a grad, you know, grad senior. You're gonna play if you play. I mean, Mike Hughes came in 
two weeks before the season started, and he was the best cornerback, so he's starting a corner. So I, I think that that definitely helps recruiting. When you're winning, that definitely helps recruiting. And, you know, you got cool uniforms, you know, the, the crowd is starting to get a little, a little bit better. The atmosphere is getting a little bit better. The buzz is there. So, yeah, right now this is probably the peak that, you know, this is not, not, not the peak, but this is the peak of at least the Scott Frost era in terms of recruiting. And they're, they're going to start taking advantage now. Now you, you try it on a couple of four stars and so on. But, yeah, definitely. I mean, recruiting should, should take a, a tick up now. Are there any player positions that are really necessary for UCF to recruit at this point? Are there, are there any gaps that they need to fill for next year? Yeah, I think they're still looking at offensive line. I think that's one of the spots that they're still looking at. Um, they just added a, ju- a Juco cornerback, which I know that was a big deal for them. They're still looking for a safety. You know, Trey Neal and Kyle Gibson are both going to be seniors next season, so they're still looking for one guy back there. Um, and then on the offensive side of the ball, receivers, you know, you're probably going to lose Traquan Smith to either the draft or somewhere else, most likely the draft. But, you know, you got re- you got to find a way to replace him. And you have some talent on a receiver, but, you, you know, you can, you always got to bring in more guys. So probably receiver, offensive line, and then, you know, probably that safety role, a guy that can play a little bit of corner, a little bit of safety, or a nickel corner guy. Those are probably the four spots where they're, they're still trying to get a little bit more guys. And one more linebacker is another that Gilliard's on board. Right. You've been watching this team, and, and you've been following the recruiting for a few years now, and, and you've watched the recruiting, especially under Scott Frost here recently. Is there anybody that was recruited uh, by Scott Frost so far that has been a really big a surprise to you that's maybe done better than you thought that he would or, or done worse than they, you thought that they would? Yeah, I mean, Richard Grant's probably one of those guys that kind of surprised me. Um, I thought he was a little bit of a reach, you know, in the first recruiting cycle when they were a little bit rushed. But he's been great. I mean, he, he doesn't really necessarily get a lot of the praise because of the two starters back there. But he's been really good quietly. He's a, he's a good special teams player. So he's a guy that's, that's definitely stepped up and, and, and showed some signs. And probably on offense, and Gabe Davis is kind of one of those guys too. I mean, he's a local kid, so I, you know, a lot of people liked him. But I, I thought that he was a, a little bit of a reach too. I thought if, if he wasn't a hometown kid, he probably wouldn't end up here. But he's been great. I mean, he's he's a good blocker. He starts a receiver, obviously as a true freshman, so that's a big deal. So those are those are the two guys probably on each side of the ball that have surprised in a good way, um, and it's a good sign. It shows that they actually put in the time to evaluate these kids and. And you know, probably the bad side would probably be Emmanuel Green. He's he's still he's still trying to find his own. Um, but yeah, the staff does a great job evaluating these kids, and and it shows. I think back to the beginning of the season, and we were concerned about the suspensions of Tristan Payton and Neville Clark, and we wondered how are things going to work out. Now these guys are coming back. Where do you see them fitting in? How do they get back into the mix? Yeah, I mean, this is the perfect time for you to come back from a suspension. I mean, this actually worked out perfectly for UCF. You, got, you know, you, like you mentioned, you win the, six, the first six games, you're 6-0, and all, you're sitting pretty, and then you get two of your, you know, your most talented guys, and you get Austin P. So a lot of guys are going to get into the game. They're probably going to you know, get their, their, their feet wet a little bit, and then we'll, we'll see after that when, when, when they travel to SMU. I think Navelle Clark is probably the guy that they need the most, you know, receiver the, the receiving core has been pretty good. Um, Brandon Moore had a hell of a game yesterday, but he he still struggles. He still he still gets down on himself when he gets a penalty or you know, a guy catches the ball on him. So Neville Clark could be huge. I still think Neville Clark is the best co- cover guy on the team, including that includes Mike Hughes. I think Mike Hughes is more explosive. So yeah, Neville Clark adds a different dimension to the team. And uh, what was kind of a weak secondary couple of weeks ago it's not it's starting to look like a bit of a strength for UCF week in and week out we're joined by, by former UCF quarterback Nick Patty and he alluded to something in one of his recent appearances where he's talked about the offense has been so explosive that in some ways it has masked some deficiencies and do you think that secondary is still a deficiency that it hasn't really uh, been exploited the way it could or have these guys grown up a lot over these six games I think they've grown up a lot. I think Brandon Moore, especially, and you kind of got to see that yesterday. Again, he's a young kid. That was his sixth college football game. And it kind of goes back to being a little bit spoiled with some of these guys that come in and, and play right away. Um, I, think he's done a good, I think he's done a solid job. I, think, I don't think he's been great by any means. But 
um, he's done a good job. And that was his sixth college football game. I think by the end of the season, he won't be a freshman anymore. And he can actually contribute a little bit more. So I think the secondary is, is, is starting to look up now. You, you add a guy like Navel Clark, who, you know, even even last year, a lot of people told me that he was probably the best cover guy on the team, which says a lot because you had, you know, the uh, Killings who, who, you know, didn't make it to the NFL, but wasn't wasn't a practice squad, and then Shaquille Griffin was a third rounder. So that was that was high praise for him. They they continue to tell me that he's still the best cover guy on the team. So. I think I think it should be a strength moving forward. The two safeties are good, even though they struggled a little bit yesterday against Mary. But they'll, they'll get a test against SMU in a, in a couple of weeks, so that'll be interesting to watch. But yeah, I think they've definitely grown up. I think they 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 still have a lot of ways to go, but it's looking up right now. For folks who don't follow it quite as intently as you do on a day to day basis, help folks understand what sort of football shape are Peyton and Clark in as they return to the team for active games? Um, they're, they're probably not in, in very good game shape. They have been practicing with the team. I know Tristan Payton was a scout team quarterback last week when, you know, when, when Scott Frost kind of needs a, a little bit of a breather. So I know, Tristan, I know they've both been doing some scout team work. Um, game shape will t- probably take a little bit, and that will come with Austin Peay. You know, ideally, you want to get them in for a half just so they can kind of get their feet wet a little bit, get back into a little bit of game shape. So game shape will take a little while. I don't think you'll start seeing an impact, uh, much of an impact from them until maybe game two, game three. But those are, these are these are the two most athletic guys on the team. You know, Tristan Payton can pretty much play anywhere, and he'll he'll contribute just because of his physical ability. So I think they'll be fine. I think you got to give them a little bit of time. I think people are expecting, you know, especially Tristan Payton just because of who he is to kind of just jump in and be the number one receiver again. But it'll take time. Um, but I think they'll get there. So on this commitment list, who would be your top player that for UCF at this point? The best player I've watched on the commit list is probably Justin McGriff. He's a tight end from the, from the Tampa area. He's about six six. He's a little bit he's a little lanky right now, but he's I mean he's very good. His cash rate is really good. Every time I saw him on seven on seven, I saw him in pads one one time. He looks the part. I mean he's a guy that I know I know Coach Beckton is really high on. Um, I say Bellamy is another tight end that they're high on. He kind of he plays quarterback for his high school, so there's not much tight end tape on him. But Coach Beck saw him in a in a in a practice playing tight end, and he said, "I need this kid." So you know, those are, UCF is really good at getting creative, at getting some of these kids. There's not much tape on this kid, so not a lot of people know how good he is. But he's he's another guy that's pretty good. And then Ladarius Jefferson, the quarterback out of out of Mississippi, I haven't watched him personally. But he's a kid that you know he's riding up Mississippi. Um, he's riding up Michigan football because he plays in Michigan. So he's another guy that's going to come in and give you know the quarterback room another guy that can that can run the offense. And then the fourth guy I'll probably say Edward Collins, another offensive lineman from from Alabama. He's a kid that you know he might end up being a four star when it's all said and done. And the coaching staff is really high on him. And now just the key is just to hold on to some of these guys because some of these guys have some legit offers and. And they're all, they're all in on UCF, though, which is good. I think we need a new crystal ball here at the 1148 Studios because I remember at Football Media Day talking to Tyler Hudanek, thinking he was the key to the turnaround on the offensive line, and we haven't seen him a whole lot. Why is this line better than we expected? <laughs> That's a great question. I mean, I, I feel like we all, we, we all thought the offensive line was still a work in progress, but they've been really good. And Jake Brown's been it's been the one guy that's just stepped up and you know just handled his own. I mean he's a guy not you know nobody really talks about. And I you know I reported maybe a day before the game that he was starting at a, a, you know on the offensive line. So he's a guy that's really stepped up. Um, Wyatt Miller and Aaron Evans have been really good. Sam Jackson off the bench has been really good. Chavis Dickey, you know you can go on and on. So some of these guys are just they're, they're bought in. Jordan Johnson's been really good at center. The center spot's probably the most important one in this offense, and he's been really good. So, you know, just buying in and buying in on the offense, and I feel like they just understand the blocking skills a little bit better. And, you know, Coach Austin's done a great job with them. So, yeah, Danik hasn't played much. He played a little bit. He, you know, the Navy game was probably the first game that I've seen, I've seen him play in a couple of games. I um, mean, he still favors his, you know, his leg a little bit of his surgery. So it's going to take time with him. But yeah, once he once he comes 100 percent or close to it, I feel like the offensive line will be even better than what we've seen. 
All right, so you studied the recruiting for this team. You you studied them all year long, basically all off season long. Did you mm-hmm. ever expect this team to be six and zero? I mean, really, for us that this is pretty <laughs> unexpected, honestly. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I I put on my my um, preseason predictions and I picked UCF to go nine and three. So I I did think I think I was a little bit higher than most people were on them. Uh, but no, not six and zero. I think that's that's a surprise to all of us. And, you know, obviously you had the Georgia Tech game in the week three that never got played. Memphis game week two, which would have been tougher than when they actually got to play them. So I definitely didn't see six and zero, and I definitely didn't see six and zero just the way that they're doing things. I mean, they're just absolutely dominating teams. Um, yeah, so it's it's been it's been really fun to watch. It's been really fun to watch some of these guys kind of take take that step up. And it's fun. It's fun to cover a good team, you know. Obviously, we we try and take the fan out of it. Um, so it's just been really fun to see a good team. All right. So two uh, answers for you on this one. You're you're given the two answers. Yeah. If who goes down on offense, the season starts to go south. If who goes down on defense, the season starts to go south. On offense, the, well, the easy answer will be Mackenzie Milton, obviously, because he makes a, he makes everything go. But I won't go with the easy answer. I'll probably say Adrian Killens would be that guy. Because um, even when he's not getting the handoffs, just everyone just knows that he's on the field just because he's the biggest difference maker on the team. So I'll probably say Adrian Killens on the offensive side of the ball, even though McKenzie's the most important because he's a signal caller. And then on defense, I would probably say I would probably say one of the defensive linemen. I mean, that's that's just, that's the strength of the, of the defense, we, whether it's Tristan Hill, Tony Garrard, or Jeremiah Pittman. If one of those guys goes down, they have Joey Connors and guys like that, that can step up, but it's still a step down. So that's that's the strength of the team. They kind of exerted themselves as, as, as a strong point against Navy yesterday. So probably one of those guys, and then on offense will be Adrian Killings. A year ago, Justin Holman went down, and they threw Mackenzie Milton into the deep end of the pool. If Mackenzie went down, and you had to throw Noah Vedral into the deep end of the pool, how would he do? Uh, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's another one of those drop-offs that we kind of saw last season. And you know, Vedral's a really good player. I think he's only had two incompletions this season, but you know, that shrinks up the playbook a ton. You know, you you, you can't really run much of your offense with a backup quarterback, so. Yeah, if Mackenzie Milton gets hurt, that, again, that he's he's obviously the most important person on on the offense, just because you know you could do a lot more things with him. But I think Bedard's a very serviceable backup. But again, he's a true freshman, so you kind of go through the same growing pains that you did with Mackenzie last year, uh, which is part of the reason why I never really bought into the old Dario Max starting thing. That seems like forever ago now, because um, you don't want to deal with a true freshman headache. So yeah, if Mackenzie Milton goes down. You know, probably the season's kind of starts spiraling down from there. I know that you guys probably gave Coach Frost a grade on the uh, recruiting class that that he got or whatever. What was that grade, and what would you give it now, having seen some of these players on the field? Last season, I gave him an A. It wasn't an A plus only because they missed one more offensive lineman. You know, obviously we all know the Victor Beach situation <laughs> that went down there, so. Um, that's the only reason why they didn't get an A+. plus. They still had the best class in the AAC um, comfortably, too, especially after they added Cordero and Richardson. And this year, it, was, it, would be an a, this year, it would actually be an A+, plus as, as it stands right now, just because they're, they're hitting on their, on their top guys. They haven't really missed on any of the other guys that they were supposed to get or expected to get. So, yeah, it, it, again, it's a lot easier when you're winning, um, and it's a lot easier when, when the kids can just see that you know, the, the culture is different. You know, you're not really running that pro style offense. You're not wearing, you know, the khaki uniforms. You're, you know, it's it's fun to play football here, and it's fun. It's a fun atmosphere. Um, and Coach Frost and his staff will do a great job of relating with these kids. You know, some some of the best recruiters in the AAC are, are, are on UCF staff. You, you know, the Joven DeWitts, the, you know, Eric Chenanders, guys like that. They're on the staff, and they, they do a really good job of recruiting. So, yeah, it will be an A-plus right now. Some of the kids that they've gotten, um, probably wouldn't be at UCF in years past, just because of, of, of you know the talent level and and just like some of the guys that they're going against. I mean, today they went up against North Carolina State. Uh, Patrick Jolly, they went up against North Carolina. So just a, just the teams that they're going up against to get, land some of these kids is really impressive. And and it's, start, it's starting to show on the field and it's starting to show off the field and, and in recruiting. 
Talk about injuries just real quick. Uh, Jawan Hamilton goes out for the season. Uh, Dedran Bacote Sweat goes out for the season. Where is the team at the halfway mark from a health standpoint uh, as uh, as this Austin P week uh, gets underway? It's probably about as good as you can hope for. Obviously, you don't want to see Jawan Hamilton get hurt. Um, DJ Bacotti hurt a little bit, but he, you know, he's a second stringer. Obviously, Jawan Hamilton is just starting running back. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's about as good as as you can hope for at this time of this of the year. You know, you, ideally, you want to get through Austin P healthy, get into that SMU game. You know, with, with full strength. So yeah, it's been as bad as good as you know. If, if you would have told Scott Frost that you wouldn't have one or two injuries in midway through the season at the beginning of the year, he probably would have taken it. So. You know, again, losing Hamilton sucks for the team, but when you have a guy like Adrian Killis and Otis Anderson, who's been really good, Taj McGowan, four catches for 42 yards yesterday, Cordero Richardson still there. So, yeah, that that was a disappointing loss, but if, there, if there's one area where you could lose a player, it'll probably be running back. So, yeah, the team is, the, the, the health of the team is, is in a good spot right now. I actually saw Bacote the other day, uh, yesterday, and he said that he will be off of the crutches in another week. So that is good for sure for him. Uh, and he's taking a yeah, red shirt for, sure. for I mean, this I, season. I know there and, might be a possibility where he could come back this season. Um, I just don't know if that's necessarily what the coaching staff would want to do. Obviously, he still has rehab and all that stuff. And if he plays again, he can apply for the extra year. Yeah, he told me he was going to take the red shirt, so or the you know the yeah, medical red it shirt. It makes more so. sense for him and 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 the team in general. But he looks good, and and then that's good that he's going to be off the crutches soon. So that's a, a positive step for him for sure. So our crystal Absolutely. ball is not too good here at eleven forty eight. In your crystal ball, do you see a Black Friday showdown with the cows from Tampa for all the marbles and the eight? ACs. Yeah, I think it'll be undefeated against undefeated. I think uh, I, th- I actually thought the Tulane game was probably the last true test for USF on their schedule. If I'm not, if I'm remember correctly, Houston. So they've got they'll, Houston they'll coming up. By they got Houston now. Yeah, they've got Houston this week. Okay. Yeah. So if they get if they get to this one, you know, they, which they should, um, then they'll 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 be undefeated. And I think at this point, I think you know, obviously UCF fans don't want to root for USF, but I think that's probably the best thing that could happen for the rivalry, just kind of get one of those games for for all the marbles and undefeated against undefeated. It'll be good nationally, and it, it'll be good for recruiting. It'll be good for pretty much every, everyone involved. And then, you know, UCF fans will obviously hope that UCF can win that game. But I think at this point, you just kind of root for UC, US, UCF and USF to, to be undefeated when they play each other and just go at it. They've never been good on the, in the same year, so this is this is, a, this is good for the rivalry. It'll, it'll make the war on I-4 mean a little bit more, so that's good. Well, the uh, predictor on ESPN right now says that UCF will beat USF like 75% uh, so that's pretty good. I'm looking forward to that. That is definitely the one that we're looking forward to. Tell everybody where they can follow you if they don't know and about all your stuff you got going on yeah i mean obviously i'm with nice 24 7 for 24 7 sports you can you can follow me on twitter at juan j-u-a-n c torib t-o-r-i-b as in boy i-o um and then as trey said i do q and a's every now and then mostly when i'm kind of stuck in the airport but you know i'm always looking to talk to ucf fans which just kind of engage with you guys so that's where you can find me and some of the work is nice 24 com recruiting team stuff i'm, I'm there every day they're kind of sick of me by now, but they can't get rid of me yet. All right, man. Thank you very much. It was nice talking with you. Yeah, no problem.